Hello, in this video we are going to see an approach for using JavaScript in a Shopify theme. The reason for making this video is that while in Shopify you can use JavaScript as in any other site or platform by simply putting the URL of a JavaScript file as the source of a script tag, there are some ways we can take advantage of the APIs that Shopify has made available for us. So without further ado, let's get started. First, let's recap how to include JavaScript files. So as you can see over here, we are using the asset URL filter and the name of the file. This file needs to be in the assets directory. If I scroll down over here, you're going to see constants.js. And I need to use the asset URL filter to get the exact URL where Shopify is hosting this file. And while we can also set the SRC attribute to point to another domain, as you can see over here, for example, an external CDN that's hosting a JavaScript library we intend to use, you will see here, if I hover over this, that we have a warning saying that we should serve assets from Shopify CDN for better performance. Assets will be served from Shopify CDN whenever we are using the asset URL filter. That's why in the other script tags over here, we are not seeing this warning. The reason we get better performance if we start from there is because the browser won't have to connect to a different domain to get those assets. Instead, it can get it all from the same Shopify CDN domain, which it was going to use anyways as product images and other store assets are hosted there regardless. In these script files, we can have any sort of JavaScript code as long as a browser can run it. So there are multiple ways to approach working with JavaScript in a store. From putting it all in a single file and running query selector to parse the DOM, get the elements you need, and attach some behavior to them, to using tools like jQuery or even a JavaScript framework such as React or Vue. However, the approach I'll cover in this video is the way Dawn is approaching JavaScript. As mentioned throughout this series of videos, Dawn is an open source theme created and maintained by Shopify, so we can use it as an example on how to approach some aspects of the Shopify theme development ecosystem. The way Don is approaching this is by using custom elements. In case you're not familiar with them, custom elements are a way to define your own custom HTML tags with JavaScript and attach some behavior to them. This is part of the web components and specification, however, it can be used independently, which is mostly what we'll be doing in this video. You can see over here in Can I Use that custom elements are supported in every modern browser. Safari has this note over here which refers to this, saying that autonomous custom elements are supported, but customized built-in elements are not. This is because the custom elements API also covers extending default HTML elements, like for example, text area, to add additional behavior to them. Safari doesn't support that part of the custom elements API, but it supports defining our own custom elements and attaching behavior to them, which is exactly what we will be doing in this video. We'll see later in the video the code I created using this API working just fine in Safari. Now let's see an example. For this, I'm going to enable the card drawer as most stores have one. So here, I'm going to say card type. This will be a drawer. And if I refresh this here, I have drawer enabled. The reason I enabled it is because in this theme, the card drawer is a custom element. So let's dive deeper into that. Now, with the DevTools open, if I inspect this element and go off, you can see this card drawer element. This is a custom element. The HTML specification doesn't have a card drawer element. And we can infer that this is a custom element just by looking into it because it has two words separated by a hyphen. Native HTML elements generally only have a single word. This card drawer element is the one that contains all the logic for managing the card drawer in the store. So let's look at the code now to see how that looks like. Now, if I go to the assets directory and here in cardrawer.js, this is where all the logic for the cardrawer lives. Here, a class is being defined, cardrawer, which is extending HTML element. This is necessary for using the custom elements API. Then in the constructor, we are calling super to call the constructor for HTML element. And later, if we collapse this class here, custom elements that define card drawer. This is the HTML tag that is used over here. This is this card drawer tag. And then we are passing in this card drawer class to attach all the logic of this class to this tag over here. And this custom elements over here is how we interact with the custom elements API in the browser. So it is available by default. One of the advantages that this have is that we can directly interact with the element in a very simple way. Here for the drawer, for example, we can quickly open or close it by calling the appropriate methods. So if I do document that query selector card drawer and then do that open, this opens the drawer 
and if I do dot close, this closes the drawer. This is working because I can use query selector to get this element as it is in the DOM, and then I can use dot open or dot close because if I go here to this core drawer.js file, you can see that there is a open and there is a close method defined here. So when this class is attached over here to this element, all of these methods are available to be called the way I just showed you from other places within your code. Now, so far what we've seen is nice, but we are not using any Shopify specific API yet. So let's get a more advanced example. For this, let's use this same card drawer custom element. And in this case, I've added an item to the card to illustrate the following example. If we add an item to the card, we want the drawer to be updated. But there is an issue there, which is that to update the card with the latest items from our JavaScript code, we will have to know the structure of a card item in the drawer and replicate it. So basically, if I added another item, I want that item to appear below this one over here, both with the same structure that this item has and with the updated data, of course. The issue with that is that this code right now, this template is living in liquid and I don't have it in JavaScript. So I have a couple of options there. I could do a query selector to get this TR element, find the places where the title, the price and the image are and update them with the data for the new item that I just added. Or perhaps I could keep the template in JavaScript. Both solutions would work, but that is adding complexity to our, to our code already, and we can do something simpler by using Shopify section rendering API. This is the way Don is approaching updating the data for the different custom elements that would benefit from it. With this API, you delegate to the server the task of giving you a part of your page with the latest data, so you simply have to replace the HTML, which we can do by setting the inner HTML or even the outer HTML properties to the new data. This plays nicely with the custom elements API because they have lifecycle methods, so whenever a custom element gets added to the DOM, it will call the same methods starting from its constructor. This means that we don't have to worry about reinitializing the element. The browser will take care of that for us. Now let's see a simple example of this in action. So let's say that we wanted to increase the quantity of this item by one in the cart. To do so, you might think that it is as simple as making this item to this number over here to be two and multiplying this price by two. But there are other places that need to be updated as well. For example, the total over here, it is not as simple as multiplying this by two because there might be other items in the cart also you will have to update this card bubble over here to represent the amount of items that are now in the card, which will be two. And if your store had something like discounts for having two of the same item in the card, say for example, we have a 10% discount if we have two of this item in the card, as soon as we increase the quantity, we want that discount to be shown somewhere over here. Now, if I click on this add button over here, let's inspect this change request to the change endpoint for the Shopify Cart Ajax API. In payload over here, this is the data that we are sending to the endpoint. So we want the first line item, this one, to be updated with a quantity of two, which we set over here. And we want these two sections to be updated. So the card drawer and the card icon bubble. The card drawer will be this one and the card icon bubble will be this over here. Now, if we get to preview the response, this is all the updated data but what's important over here is this sections property. Here we get a key for card drawer and card icon bubble, the same keys we passed over here, and the value will be their updated HTML. Now let's see how the theme is getting from this string of HTML to the updated card. And this is how this looks like in the code. So here we have this quantity input custom element, and in the constructor we are doing a query selector role for all the button elements. Note that here we're doing this.querySelectorRole instead of document.querySelectorRole. By doing this.querySelectorRole, we are making sure that the query selector is scoped to the elements inside of this custom element over here, because quantity input is a custom element. So that query selector role will only return this minus button and this plus button over here. Then to each one of those buttons, we are attaching a click event listener and calling this on button click method when the button is clicked. Then here, depending on the target name, we are increasing or decreasing the value of this input by calling the step up or step down method of the input respectively. So the input will be this one over here. And then we are going to be dispatching a change event, which will be defined over here. The change event we are dispatching is this one. 
Then over here you're going to see that we have this card drawer items custom element, which is just targeting the items in the card, not the full card drawer, which we saw earlier. And if we look for the code of this in carddrawer.js, we are going to see that it is very short because it is extending from card items, which is a custom element already created. So the only thing this is doing is updating the sections that need to be re-rendered because the regular card items is for the card page and the card drawer items is for the drawer. So the sections have a slightly different IDs. Anyways, if we go to card.js, this is where card drawer is defined. And this one will be this custom element. It is a pretty long one with over 200 lines, but we are interested in this adequate listener line for the change event because this is the event that is emitted over here from quantity input. And as you can see over here in the HTML structure, quantity input is inside of card drawer items. Therefore, when the change event is emitted, card drawer items can't catch that event because the event will bubble up. So then if you look for this debounce and change, it will be over here. It is debouncing this on change method because we don't want to update the UI right away as the customer might click on the plus or minus button multiple times. If we go now to the onChange method, it is calling this update quantity. So all of these values that it is getting from, from the event are line, quantity, name, and variant ID, which it is grabbing from all of these properties. And here is where we are building the request. We saw all of this a moment ago. So line and quantity, sections, which are the sections that we want to re-render, and section URL, which is just the page we are calling this from. The get sections to render is the method that got extended when we extended this class. So get sections to render now will return this array over here instead of the one that is defined over here. Because these are the sections to re-render for the card page, and these are the sections to re-render for the card drop. Anyways, from this, we are mapping this to get section.sections, which is the section identifier. The identifier will be the file name. So if we look for card drawer in sections, we are going to see this is the file that will get re-rendered for this section. And the same will happen for card icon bubble. We can see that there is a section. This is the section that will be re-rendered for this card icon bubble over here. Now, over here for the response, which we get here, we are parsing this and then we are running some validations, but the interesting part happens over here. So we get once again these sessions to render array and we go for every session, we are going to get it from the DOM. So we first get the ID and then the selection, the selector within that section for the element we wish to replace. So we get, get the element by ID of the section.id, this property over here, and then we do a query selector within that to get this section that selector. Or if that is not available, then we just get the whole section by doing section that get element by ID. Then over here, this gets element to replace, and then we replace the inner HTML of this element we just got with the result that we got from this dot get section inner HTML, which if you see over here, what it is doing is that it is receiving the HTML we got from the response from the server, so that long string we saw a moment ago, and it is using the DOM parser API to create a proper DOM node with that HTML, and then returning that. I know this example wasn't the easiest one to follow, but hopefully now you saw what's possible by combining the custom elements web API and the Shopify sections rendering API. This card drawer items custom element has so much code because it is taking into consideration things like an empty state, accessibility, validation errors, and more. So even if we build this with something like view, that might simplify things, there's some unavoidable level of complexity to build a production grade component that handles this interaction for an e-commerce site. The theme is open source, so feel free to dive into the code for that custom element to further understand what it is doing. We are now going to build our own custom element that will use the section rendering API to see a simpler example of this in action. So the section we're going to be building is one that loads all the products in the store, but that loads them a batch at a time. So for this, Let's create a section over here. Let's call this all products liquid, for example. Let's quickly create a schema. The name will be all products. 
we will have settings is a single one of type number the ID will be values per row and the label will be products or not. Then we're going to do here presets so it shows in the editor and we'll add here all products. Then let's print this value so section dot settings dot products per row and let's save this and now let's open the editor and add this section to the page. So I'll click on this and from here I'm going to look for all products. Here it is and let's say we want to display three products per row. Uh, let's move this section to the top and let's save this. If I refresh this here I have my section showing at the top. So now let's start building this. I'm going to be adding all the CSS and JavaScript into this liquid file while building this and then in the end I'm going to move them each one to their own file. So let's add a div here. Let's give it a class of page width which works in this theme as a container. So this is what will keep the content from going to the edges of the screen and instead be nicely aligned as the other sections in the page. So let's move this here for now and see what we get. Here we, we have this aligned. Next, let's create here our custom element, so all products and all products over here. We are going to have here a div. This will have a class of grid. And then here we're going to have a button with a class of button. And we are going to give it a load more text. We can remove this for now or get out of this. And let's see what we have. We have the button. So far it is doing nothing. But then I'm going to command this line over here. Let's start loading the products. So for this I'm going to do for product in collections not all the products and let's give it a limit of let's copy this value from here paste it here and end for and now I'm going to do render card product and for product I'm just going to pass it product actually this should be card product because that's the name of the parameter that this snippet expects so if I go to now card product this is the snippet that we are rendering and this is this over here now this is not looking that good but we can style this to make it look something better. So let's do all products dot grid, and this will have a display grid. And then here, let's give it a grid template columns of repeat three and one fr. So we have three columns over here. Let's have now a gap of. 16 pixels and let's see how this is looking. So here we have three items. We have an extra bracket at some point over here. Let's see if we can find it. So the issue we have is that this was malformed. This should be here between those tags. And now we don't have this thing anymore. Now let's make this value dynamic. So let's start by passing the products per row variable to CSS so items per row let's name this and now let's copy it from here and paste it here and let's copy this one from here and paste it over here so var 
I will paste this. And this shouldn't change anything right now. But if I go to the editor here now and make this a four, we get four items per row. And if I make this three again, we get three items per row. So this is working. Next, we are going to need a handle for the remaining products. So let's do four product. Let's actually just copy all of this from here, paste it here. And now we are going to do offset. So it starts after this index. So these are going to be the remaining products. And I'm going to create a variable here, sign remaining products. This will be an empty string for now. And then over here, I'm going to say, sign remaining products will be equal to remaining products. And then I'm going to append here, product.handle, because the way we tell Shopify to load data for a product is not through its ID, but through its handle. And we're going to have here an unless, unless for loop that last. We are also going to append the comma. So remaining products will be equal to remaining products, append, and a comma. And we are going to put this now as a data attribute. So data remaining products will be equal to remaining products. This shouldn't change anything, but if we inspect the code here, we should be seeing the handle for the remaining products over here. Now let's get all of this from JavaScript and add the missing behavior. So I'll create a script tag over here. And let's say class all products. This will extend HTML element. We're going to have the constructor here. And right away, let's call super. And then custom elements that define all products. And we're going to pass here all products. Let's add a simple console log here to see if this is working. So entered the constructor. If we go to the console, we see enter the constructor, so our element got defined. Let's now initialize our properties. So this dot load more button will be equal to this dot query selector. And I'm just going to query selector for a button because this will be the only one. Then I'm going to do this dot products per row. And we have to pass this as a data attribute, because remember, that script will be in a different file eventually. Data, products, or row, will be equal to this. So I'm going to do this the data set dot products per row. I could also have done a get attribute of data products per row, both work fine. Then I'm going to say this dot remaining products and I'm going to do this dot data set dot remaining products and I'm going to do a split by comma to make this an array and let's see if we got this working so this dot remaining products here we have the array Finally, we need the grid. So this dot grid will be equal to this dot query selector grid. Now to this dot load more button, we are going to add an event listener. The type of here add event listener for click, and I'm going to do this dot load more products. I have to bind this so I can access this over here. 
this function that I'm going this function or method that I'm going to define over here load more products this should be a synchronous so for now let's just add a constant log loading more products and verify that this is working here we have it the approach we'll use to load the appropriate products per row is to keep track of the index we are at in this remaining products array so let's start by creating a variable over here index this will be zero and then from here let's start using this so let's remove this constant log now let's do const products to load this will be equal to this dot remaining products dot slice we are going to start at this dot index we are going to end at this dot index plus this dot products per row then we're going to do const products and we are going to be optimistic here and do promise dot all this will throw an error if any of these requests fail so if you are if you are doing this in production you should probably use all settled or something like that but anyways i'm going to do products to load dot map this will be asynchronous async product handle and then here i'm going to do response will be equal to await fetch we are going to do products we need to pass the product handle here then we're going to say sections we are going to render here cart product then the data will be equal to response json and finally we're going to return data card product because we are rendering the card product section let's then print over here the value of products and see what we get so if i click this i get no no and no that is because the card product section doesn't exist we are going to fix this right now so i'm going to create here card product dot liquid and here I'm going to render a snippet card product and the card product will be product. Let's refresh the page. Let's try again. And now we have these three HTML elements. So why did I have to do this? Well, this is the section rendering API. So it expects the name of a section. It's not able to render a snippet right now. However, we can work around that by creating a section that just calls that snippet. You can see that if I look for card product, it was a snippet, and now we also have a section with this same name where we are just calling this snippet and passing product as a card product. And where is this product here coming from? Well, if we go back to all products here, you can see that we are fetching the products page. And from the products page, we are rendering this section. So basically, the context from within this section will be rendered, will be the product page. Therefore, the global product variable will be available containing the data for the product we are passing here as a handle. So what I can do now is products.foreach product. And here I can do this.grid.innerHTML and I'm just going to add product. Then I'm going to say this.index and I'm going to increase this by these two products per row. Let's save this. And if I click on this, we get more products and we keep getting new products. Although we seem to have a bug over here. That is because I need to do number dot parse int and turn this into a number instead of a string because when I do this at data set dot products per row these values be received as a string. If I refresh the page now 
I can load products. And you're going to see that now we are loading three at a time until we reach the end. Now, it would be nice if we could remove this load more button once we reach the end. So let's do that now. If this dot index is greater or equal than this dot remaining products dot length, then I'm going to do this dot load more button dot remove. So if I do load more, load more, load more, and load more, you're going to see that at the end, the button gets removed. We can also add another improvement here by doing this dot load more button dot set attribute and setting disabled to be true at the beginning here. And then here, if we are going to continue loading more products, we are going to remove the disabled attribute. So remove attribute disabled. We're going to see that as I click this, the button gets disabled while it is loading more data. Let's also quickly center this button over here. So let's style all the products because this is also an HTML element, so it can be styled. I'll say display flex, flex direction to be column, align items center. We are going to give it a gap of 20 pixels. Let's save this. And we also have to give this a width of 100%. This could also benefit from having some vertical padding. So let's do padding 20 pixels and zero horizontally. And this all working fine, but it now looks a bit better. Now let's move the CSS and the JavaScript to their own files. So I'm going to move this from here and create all products.css and paste this here and remove this style tag from here. And I'm going to do the same for this JavaScript. I'm going to remove it from here. And let's create all products.js and paste this here. After saving this, I'm going to see that this breaks and this button doesn't work. But I can, from here, do all products.css asset URL, style sheet tag to get the styling working back again. And then in this script tag, I can set the SRC to be all products.js, asset URL, send this to async. And this button is now working again. And let's remove this comment, we don't need it anymore. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, we were also going to get this working in Safari. So, so far I've been working in Chrome, but over here I have Safari open. So if I click on this load more button, we see the behavior we've been working with throughout the video. And there we have the last item. And finally, let's see the code that to other number of items per row. For example, let's set this to five we see that the CSS adapted. Let's save this. And now if I click on load more, we can see that the button is adapting just fine. We are loading five items per row. The last row has three, and then the button disappears. And there you have it. This is one way of approaching working with JavaScript in a Shopify team. If you found the video helpful, remember to like and subscribe for more Shopify related content, and I'll see you all in the next video.